Dustin began to lead a local church at the age of 21 while also serving as a Bible college principal. Recently, he has served as youth pastor at Calvary Christian Church and as Youth Alive Regional Director on the Sunshine Coast. Now together with his wife, Sarah, he is the campus pastor at Calvary Townsville. Please welcome to the platform, Dustin Bell. Good morning. How you doing? Who is well slept? It's quite surprising. That's because this is not a youth camp, it's a youth leaders camp. Who is caffeinated this morning? Can I just say, this is like the best coffee I've ever had on any kind of camp ever. And we've got Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters making coffee as well. And can I just say, I never knew that Daniel Craig, a.k.a. James Bond, is in the Salvation Army. It's amazing. It's amazing. Very good. Well, uh, it's been just a real joy to be here and spend some time. Um, some of my new friends last night knocked on our door and delivered, like, New Zealand cookies to our door when Andy and I were having a cup of tea. And so I just say, God bless New Zealand. Your cookies are amazing. And your, your rugby union team is pretty good. And uh, you need to pray for me because I'm an AFL lover. Some of you are like, oh, that's reason to pray for you. And I'm, my wife and I are moving to South Africa in November. And they don't play AFL there. They mock AFL there. And so I have to support the second best union team in the world, the Springboks. Second best because the All Blacks are, of course, the best team. Pains me to say that, but you are. And so... Uh, I, I am hand in hand with those moving from home to uh, serve the Lord overseas. Who knows, life's a great adventure. My wife and I figured we won't die wondering, let's just give it a crack. And what's the worst that can happen? We fly home and never talk about it again. <laughs> That's literally what we said. We fly home, never talk about it again, but we didn't die wondering. Or God could do something great. Who knows, you've got to live by faith. I think it was Helen Keller who said, life is either a daring adventure or it's nothing at all. I like that spirit. That's got nothing to do with my message. I just thought it was very wise. Um, <laughs> Exodus chapter 2 and verse 1. Exodus 2 verse 1. We've got till about 10.30. Is that right? Great. And uh, I think this morning we'll uh, hopefully be encouraging for us all. And, uh, and then we go into our workshops after that, which um, I think will be super practical as well. Uh, just high five the person next to you. Say, you look good this morning. High five the person that you ignored and say, don't be insecure, you look good too. <laughs> All right, we are in Exodus chapter 2 and verse 1. It says this, now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son and when she saw that he was a fine child, everyone say fine child, she hid him for three months. We'll explain why in a moment. Uh, when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with pit, uh, bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank and his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. The child is, of course, Moses. Can I just um, quickly point out before we go on that when uh, my wife and I were expecting our first child, possibly the most frightening moment was when my wife came home and said, baby, today I bought a Moses basket. I didn't know what a Moses basket was, but I was very suspicious as to my wife's suitability to be a mother. Because I've read the Bible and I know what you do with Moses in a basket, you let him go down the river. Can you believe they take... Anyway. Um, now, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the baby was crying because the baby was unlike baby Jesus. This baby actually cried. She took pity or uh, other versions would say she took compassion on the baby and said, this is one of the Hebrew's children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse a child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. How sneaky are women? They always get their way. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me and I will give you your wages. 
So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Um, I think much of what we do in leadership and in ministry, particularly in ministry to young people, is about what we focus on. I think what we focus on has a massive impact upon the levels of our faith, our optimism, and our courage when it comes to ministry to young people. Uh, when, uh, when my wife was going into hospital to give birth to our firstborn uh, son, I was pretty excited because, you know, this was my big moment where I was going to transition from husband status to father status. And so I was pretty psyched for it. And I knew this is my moment to be the rock of strength for my family. And so uh, my wife kicked me in the night. It was the end of 41 weeks of waiting. She kicked me at about 12.30 a.m. in the morning, and, uh, which is not unusual. She's a violent sleeper. But um, I, at this point, I knew this was the moment. And so she said, baby, I think it's happening. I said, like, right now? Or can I sleep a bit longer? And she said, uh, well, maybe a bit longer. So I slept for a little bit longer. And then um, she kicked me again. And by then, I knew it was time to go. And so we jumped in the car, my wife and me and my mother-in-law, and we're on the way to the hospital, and it's very exciting. Um, it was exciting because I could break the speed limit with a clear conscience. And so um, we're speeding to the hospital, and we get there, we get checked in, they do a few little tests, and then we get kind of put into our, our little um, birthing suite, and it was all very exciting. And then a, um, a nurse came out and said, hey, I need to administer a cannula. Well, I had no idea what a cannula was, uh, but she informed me it was, you know, a little tube that an how would you explain it? Anyone know what a cannula is? It's like a straw with a needle uh, that they put in there in case they have to do emergency procedures during the, um, the delivery. Uh, anyway, so, so the nurse who came out to do it was clearly very excited that day, and she very quickly informed us that it was her second day out of university, <laughs> which meant that at least one person in the room was excited. That was her. Uh, she was of Indian descent, which is um, kind of irrelevant, except that she would kind of flap her hands when she got excited. And so she's there with the cannula in her hand saying, I'm so excited, you're having a baby. And I'm like, just put the cannula down. And so um, my wife is sitting on the bed having contractions. I'm standing next to her on this side holding her hand uh, saying, you know, baby, just look into my eyes. I'm here for you, baby. And then, and then the, the two-day out of university graduate is flapping her hands while trying to administer a cannula, saying, I'm so excited, you're having a baby. And so um, she says, uh, just as I administer the cannula, if, if um, the sight of blood makes you feel faint, then perhaps just look away. And so I'm standing on this side, and my wife's there having contractions, and I hold her hand, and I say, that's right, baby, you just, you just look away. Just stare into my eyes. We'll be strong. This is a, this is a beautiful. And so um, as we're staring lovingly into each other's eyes, I think to myself, I better just check that she's administering this cannula correctly. Now, mind you, I, I can't even spell cannula, but I'm a man, and so therefore I've got a right just to interfere in things. And so I, I, just, I just glanced at the cannula, just, just a, a quick glance, just to make sure it was all okay. And I must have seen what was about two mils of blood And at that moment, I started to feel really tingly. And I thought, this must be what every guy feels like when they transition from being a husband to a father. I thought, maybe this is like a rite of passage. And so I'm feeling kind of really tingly, and I'm holding my wife's hand, and then I start to feel a bit clammy, and that's the last thing I remember. Because apparently, I fainted like a ton of bricks flat on the bed, like head first into the blankets, not breathing, just like <laughs> right on the bed, while my wife is having contractions and there's a two-day university graduate flapping her hand saying, I'm so excited. And so they smack the emergency button. All the nurses run in and they're like, uh, we're, we're here to help the woman. And they, they say, not the woman having contractions, the woman fainted on the bed. That's the one. That, and so... So while my wife is having contractions and has a cannula hanging out of her wrist, all of the nurses come to help me. And so they pick me up and they give me a little chairlift across the birthing suite. I wish that this were made up, but this is all true. And then they get a little recliner chair and they put me in the recliner chair and they put the little recliner up for me and they say, just wait here, sir. And then they come back with, with, a, with a cup with cordial in it and a little bendy straw. 
just so I didn't have to exert myself in, in getting a drink. And they said, just wait here, sir, until you feel better. And, and that was my grand entry into fatherhood. If you ever repeat that story, we will not be friends. Um, who knows that, that what you focus on makes a massive difference. Now I'm aware, if I look at blood, it ain't going to go good for me. The second, for our second child, I just stayed well clear, like well away. Because I know that, that what I look at determines the way that I feel. And I think it's true in ministry and leadership as well. Remember the story of Elisha and his servant. His servant wakes up in the morning and sees the armies of the enemy surrounding him and he is faint of heart. He wants to throw in the towel. He is full of fear. And then Elisha, the experienced veteran, says, Lord, just open his eyes so he can see properly. And who knows that when his eyes were opened and he focused on the right things, it's amazing how faith began to grow in his heart. Well, in Exodus chapter 2, I want to point out four things that I believe we all need to focus on or we all need to see while we're ministering to youth and young people. Because what we focus on will determine the faith in our hearts. Uh, When we get to Exodus chapter 2, just to to set the context, and I know you know this, but you know, it's early in the morning, so just to familiarize ourselves, the the people of God have been slaves in Egypt. And Moses is really pointed out by God to be the deliverer. But, but you understand that when Moses was born, he was born into a culture that was contrary or that was um, uh, difficult for the people of God to flourish in. Uh, you remember the story that a new Pharaoh arose who didn't know Joseph and started to oppress the Israelites. And so in fear of the people of Israel, the king of Egypt commands that every newborn male be thrown into the Nile. You remember this story, right? You're you're familiar with the story. And so it was into this context, the Bible says that a man and a woman from the tribe of Levi get married, become pregnant, and give birth to a child. And the Bible says that uh, the parents saw that he was a fine child. But let's be honest, which parent doesn't believe that their child is a fine child? And so they saw that he was a fine child, and yet they find themselves in this situation where we've got parents who love their child, they see the beauty in their child, they see the potential in their child, and yet they find themselves in a cultural climate that was near impossible to raise this young boy. Why? Because the society, follow this now, had been designed by Pharaoh for the destruction of young people. You catch what I'm saying? And you don't need to have a prophetic gift to realize that the Pharaoh of this age or the enemy of God's people has structured or designed society today in the same way that it makes it near impossible for young people to flourish and follow after God. I'm not trying to be a pessimist or an alarmist, but you only need to look at abortion rate. Uh, self-harm statistics, the proliferation of pornography, um, substance abuse to realize that who knows the devil has so designed our culture for the extermination of young people. Who knows that the devil is not giving up on young people. He's pushing younger and younger and younger. And so in the same way that in Exodus chapter 2, you've got a mum and dad who desperately want their child to flourish and, and reach his full potential. And yet society that they live in is constructed in a way that uh, he, he isn't going to flourish. In the same way, mum and dad aren't sure what to do. And so they hold on to the baby for three months. But who knows, there's only so long that a parent can shelter their child from culture. And so it doesn't matter if you refuse to own a television, if you grow your own vegetables and you're the president of the homeschoolers committee, there comes a point when, when, when your kids get too restless to hold on to any longer. And in Exodus, that was at the age of about three months. But I reckon in our culture, it's at about 12 to 13 years of age. You know, there's a point where you can still demand your child hold your hand when you walk down the street. Then there's that point overnight when your kids become too cool for school and they don't want to be seen with you. In other words, you can't control them any longer. Uh, You know, the 12-year-old gets one underarm hair and an attitude, and now he knows everything about life. And so mum and dad take a basket, and they put the child in it, and they place the child among the reeds by the riverbank. And so mum and dad are at their wits end. They don't feel like they've got any other options. And so they place their child there in the hope that he won't just get swept away with the currents of culture. And verse four says that at that 
that moment, his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Here's the first thing that I'd love you to see as a youth and children's worker. If you're taking notes, it is this. You've got to see that, number one, there is a family behind every baby. There is a family behind every baby. I I guarantee you that for every young person who drifts into one of your programs, there's not just a young person drifting into your program, but there's a family member who is standing afar off going, ah, okay, so they're going to the Sunday school now. They're going to the youth program now. Let's see what becomes of it. Who knows that every baby, every child is connected to a family and every time a young person comes into one of our ministries, there is an inquisitive family member watching on. Why? Because who knows, there is nothing more valuable to a parent than the well-being of their child, which gives youth and children's ministries a great opportunity. As we said yesterday in our three o'clock, se- in our one thirty session, that if you want to get to the heart of a parent, care for their child. A- and that's why youth and children's ministries have a great opportunity because who knows that when a child drifts into our care and we look after that child, it makes an enormous impression upon a mum and a dad and a sister and a brother and uncles and aunties. That's why never underestimate what you do in the youth and children's ministry. Because behind every baby, there's a family. Uh, I remember when I was youth pastoring, I was just making some phone calls to some of our young people and uh, I would try to make it a habit to not just talk to the high schooler, but to quickly say hi to mum or dad. Um, just wisdom says to do that. And so I was talking to a young kid called Jordan. Uh, Jordan had come to our youth program through one of our high school breakfasts. No church background at all. Pretty rough kid, but uh, he was a great kid. Had, uh, had made a decision for Christ. And so I, um, I was chatting to Jordan. How's school going? Good. How's your homework? Good. Had a good week? Yep. Who knows, that's actually a lengthy conversation with a teenage boy. And that was, that's called a DNM with a teenage boy. And uh, so I said, hey, Jordan, is your dad there? And he goes, yeah. I said, hey, can I say a quick hello to your dad? And so his dad gets on the line, and his dad was clearly a pretty rough Aussie guy. He goes, hello. I said, hi, my name's Dustin. I'm one of the pastors at Calvary Christian Church. <clears throat> and uh, I said, um, hey, just wanted to say thanks for allowing Jordan to come along to the program on Friday night. Um, has he been enjoying it? And, uh, and, and the dad said, look. Let me be clear. I don't, I don't believe in all that God stuff. You love it when parents say that. I don't believe in all that God stuff. But since Jordan started coming to the program, he's a better kid. I said, cool. Well, I'm going to take that as a compliment. Um, bless you, mate. Have a good week. Who knows that, that mum or dad may not yet have faith in Christ, but as soon as their child, their son or their daughter comes into your program, they're watching. Is this having a positive effect or a negative effect. Now, I would love to say that Jordan's dad came to church the next Sunday, fell on his knees weeping, saying, what must I do to be saved? That has not yet happened. But who knows that behind every baby, there is a family. And that's why in youth and children's ministry, practical things like finishing your program on time makes a big difference. Setting a term program. I always tell our youth pastor, are you communicating with parents? Are you letting them know what's coming up? Do they know how much the camp costs? Do they know when the camp is on? Uh, All those little things make a big difference. Um, Communicating to parents without spelling mistakes. Hello? Jesus invented that red squiggly line in Microsoft Word for our own benefit. Um, Doing risk assessments. All of these things matter. Why? Because we recognize we're not just ministering to young people, but we're seeking to win entire households to the Lord. And behind every baby, there is always a family. And so I want to encourage you in the ministry that you're doing, I don't know what your context looks like, but I want to encourage you always focus on the fact we're not just ministering to kids or to teenagers, we're seeking to win entire households to the Lord. Can you say amen? Amen. Number two is this, verse five, let me read verse five and then we'll go to number two. Verse five said that now the, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. Here's the second thing that I'd love us to focus on as we're doing ministry. Number two is that there is a redemptive plan behind the routines. Um, Anyone here love movies? Who loves going to the movies? Um, When you go to the movies, generally what you see is just like the superstar. And so, you know, um, if you're watching uh, The Bourne Identity, you see Jason Bourne. And that's the real highlight that you look at. 
But I was reading an article about how much work goes in behind the scenes into movies. Did you know that for the movie Iron Man 3, there were 3,310 people employed behind the scenes to make Iron Man 3 happen? Uh, you'd think they could have actually made a good movie. Uh, for the movie Avatar, 2,984 people worked on Avatar, and we know none of their names because we all walked out while their names were being rolled on the screen. 2,718 people worked on The Avengers, 2,709 people worked on The Hobbit. Uh, the Dark Knight had 258 people working just in the stunt department. Um, the Bourne Ultimatum had 60 assistant directors. Who knows that behind the scenes there is always more happening than we realize. Well, the same is true when it comes to ministry. Who knows that we only ever, with our natural eye, can see part of what's happening, but we never actually get to see the divine redemptive plan of God that is taking place behind the scenes. Pharaoh's daughter comes down to take a bath, which we wish for our teenage boys in our ministry would be a daily routine. We believe for that. Um, someone just gave an amen. Um, she comes down to take a bath. It doesn't look like anything uh, spiritual. It doesn't look like anything amazing to Pharaoh's daughter. It's just another day. She's going through the motions. She's going about her routines. But who knows that now that we read the Bible with the benefit of hindsight, we can see that in the providence of God, there was actually something amazing going on that day behind the scenes, something which would play an instrumental part in God's redemptive plan on planet Earth this was Moses, the deliverer, was being rescued and she was completely oblivious. To her, she was just taking a bath. And, 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 and what I want us to see is that God can orchestrate events to ensure that the right woman was in the right place with the right resources at the right time. Who knows that God can be at work in our lives and we don't even know it. Now, I think most of the time we realize God was at work in hindsight. I think we're going to get to heaven and be like, wow, that night that I thought was just a normal Friday night in our youth program, in fact, I went home really discouraged and deflated because I thought nothing happened. Wow, in hindsight, look at what happened there. That Sunday morning where it felt like it was a bit of a low morning and I went home thinking, yeah, yeah, that was a bit of a flat one. Man, look at what God was doing. I think Pharaoh's daughter many years later would have looked at that day and thought, I was just taking a bath and showing an act of compassion. Little did I know that that was Moses who would be the redeemer of the people of Israel, liberate them from slavery, bring them to the edge of the promised land and ultimately be one of the great leaders in all of scripture. Who knows, there is always more going on behind the scenes than we realize. Um, oftentimes in, in ministry, let me just um, be, uh, be vulnerable, you, you do things and you feel like this is doing nothing. Ever done that? Let's not do an altar call because we'll all respond. <laughs> but, but you have times where you think, is this even accomplishing anything? I remember for about three years, I ran a, a, a connect group or a, do you call them connect groups, small groups? Life group, life group. I ran a life group. And it was all kind of the kids who didn't really fit in, like the cool circle in our youth ministry. Uh, a lot of them were like, um, uh, I'm trying to be careful with what I say, low socioeconomic homes, and, and they would have done well to bathe more regularly. Um, it, was, it was a bit of an odd connect group. But I, I poured myself into it, because that's what you do. And uh, led it for about three years, they all graduated high school and just kind of dispersed. And, and I was reflecting on it one day and I thought, you know what? Fat lot of good that was. Like the amount of fuel that I spent, the amount of times I bought the Maccas and they left fries under my seat. We'll do an altar call right there. Um, and, and, and I prepared Bible studies. And, and, and you get that feeling where you think, why did I even do it? Um, about... Two years after that Connect Group disbanded, I was walking into a conference in Sydney, the Hillsong Conference, there's about 30,000 delegates at it. And uh, they take security pretty seriously at Hillsong Conference. And it's in the, it was the Acer Arena then at Olympic Park. It's a major facility. I'm walking into conference and uh, just coming through the main doors. And as I'm like 30 meters off, um, I've, I'm a bit short-sighted, so I don't see good details at the back, but all of you guys with red hair at the back look awesome. Um, <laughs> I, I couldn't really see the deep, but, but I can see this security guard on the door getting really excited. I think, gee, I wish he'd focus on his job a bit more. And then, then I can see he's looking at me. And I think, what the, 
I'm safe. And, 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 and then he goes, Dustin! And I'm like, oh boy, the security guard already knows my name. And, and then I get close enough that I can see, and I see that it's a, a boy called Jamie who was part of my connect group. I said, Jamie, what are you doing here? And he goes, I moved to Sydney. And I knew that I had to find a church. And so I went along to church, and now I'm in church, and I'm in Bible college, and they let me run security for the entire level of Acer Arena. I made a quick mental note to sit on a different level. Um, and, and, and I walked, uh, we, we chatted and caught up for a few minutes and then walked on into conference. You know what? That was my highlight of that whole conference. I, I actually don't remember any of the sermons preached. I don't remember any of the worship songs, but I still remember that moment because I thought, isn't it amazing how you pour your life into someone and you think this is coming to nothing, but who knows that God always has a redemptive plan at work, even behind the routines of our lives. Uh, the word of the Lord never returns void. It always accomplishes that which it goes out to perform. And, and so in the life of a youth and kids ministry, it can feel like a whole lot of week in, week out routines, follow up calls, life groups, picking up young people, dropping young people home, setting up the auditorium, packing down the auditorium, filling out risk assessments, filling out the injury reports, um, buying McDonald's to my life group, cleaning fries out of my car, apologizing for the gherkin on the roof to the McDonald's manager. Um, and, and, and we can be doing all of that and we can think, if only we had a move of God. Listen, right there by the riverbank that day, a move of God was taking place, but she never knew it. She only ever saw it in hindsight. And I think that oftentimes God is moving, but for us, it just looks like daily routines. I think we romanticize what a move of God looks like. Think about John chapter 6, where Jesus multiplies the bread and the fish. Who thinks that's a move of God? That's a miracle taking place. But, but can I tell you what the miracle looked like for Jesus' team? For the disciples, it looked like trying to get everyone seated in an orderly fashion. It looked like seating problems. It looked like trying to be heard over the racket of noise. They had sound system problems. It looked like trying to organize the catering with no budget. They had resource problems. It looked like trying to deal with the pushy parent who insisted that their child get special attention. I know that would never happen in New Zealand. It looked like assuring another parent that there was no peanuts in the bread and that you know what an anaphylactic reaction is and you have administered an EpiPen before. Uh, it looked like handing out the food with fish guts all over their hands. And then once the unappreciative mob had left, it looked like picking up all the leftovers because Jesus was a stickler for stewardship and wouldn't let them waste anything. And yet the whole crowd went home and went, wow, wasn't that a miracle? And the disciples went home thinking, flip, that was hard work. Because we romanticize miracles. Listen, God doesn't do magic where he just goes abracadabra. Ta-da! God does miracles. The difference between magic and miracles, magic is where we are spectators and God waves a wand. But God never does magic. God does miracles. And miracles always require our partnership. Miracles are always where God's power partners with people of faith who are willing to get their hands dirty. That's when miracles happen. And so I want to encourage you. Some of you are thinking, man, it feels like God is not moving in our ministry. I want to tell you, God is moving. And it will be with the benefit of hindsight when we get to heaven that we go, wow, I never knew that was happening. I never knew that was happening. I just thought I was taking a bath. I just thought I was running a Friday night. I just thought I was leading a worship set. And I never knew that God was at work the whole time. That encourages me. Um, let me just share a really practical thing on that before we move on. Um, that's why whenever you gather with your team, I think make it a habit of sharing good reports. We do this every week in our staff meeting at our church, and it's my favorite 10 minutes of the week. Because um, who knows that in the week, you've got a whole lot of meetings and deadlines and challenges, and you're busy, 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 and you're working, working, working. And yet for 10 minutes every week in our staff meeting, we just say, all right, who's got a good report? of something God's been doing. And, and normally there'll be half a dozen or so good reports. And, and it's amazing how it just refires your soul when you hear that, man, that young person who came in from a schools program just gave their life to Jesus. Man, I love what I do. That person, their marriage has been restored. Thank you, Jesus. Always share good reports because it just helps people to see that there is a redemptive plan at work behind their labor. Number three is this. Uh, the third thing you need to see we've got to see as youth and kids workers is, is that there is destiny behind the drama. 
Um, it, the Bible says that she opens the basket, which comes to her, and, and she thinks this is going to be beautiful. It's a baby. Oh, it's amazing. And, and so the basket comes to her, and, and all the women are gathered around, because you know what women are like with babies. Let's just think about what men are like with football. It's the equivalent. And, and so they, they open up the basket, and they're thinking, this is going to be so beautiful. It's a new baby. And so they open it up, and the Bible says, behold, they saw the baby, and the baby was crying. They open up the basket thinking this is going to be such a sweet moment. And what are they met with? Ah! The baby is crying. There's snot everywhere. It's pooped the basket. Why? It's been sitting in a basket on the river. This baby is scared. It's not cute. This baby is insecure. This baby is not sure what's going on. No wonder the baby is crying. Who knows that babies don't come cute? Babies come crying. Let me draw the parallel. We pray, God, we want to see more new Christians in our youth ministry. And so God brings them into our youth ministry. And how do they come in? <laughs> Messed up, insecure, crying, poop everywhere, a mess. And then we say, no, God, I said, I want new Christians. God says, no, it's your job to disciple them <laughs> to become, I, I want clean, sanitized babies who never vomit or puke. Sorry, it's the same thing. Um, and so, you know, we say, God, we want new Christians. You know, we want the ones that are already preloaded to know how to pray and how to forgive and don't swear and don't have issues. And, you know, we just want the babies that desire the pure milk of the word. And, and, and I think sometimes God says, oh, sorry, awkward. I, I just thought that you wanted to save sinners. Hashtag awkward. Who knows that if we're going to save people, we've got to be aware that people will come in all kinds of states and conditions, which means you've just got to be convinced. You know what? There is always going to be drama when I'm working with people. There will always be tears. There will always be mess. But I just believe that there is destiny behind the drama. I choose to look beyond the dirt and know that there is gold in here. No one ever went mining for gold and got discouraged because they saw some dirt. They know that comes with the territory. And if we're going to disciple people into their full destiny, we've just got to be prepared. There's going to be drama. One of my favorite Proverbs says this, Proverbs 14 verse 4, without oxen, a stable stays clean. Ever heard someone say, church would be awesome if it weren't for the people? <laughs> I always think our team would be awesome if it weren't for you. Um, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, you, you can't say church would be awesome if it weren't for the people. It's like saying the stable would be awesome if it weren't for the oxen. It would be awesome because it's neat. But who knows, a neat stable is not a productive stable. As someone today is doing an elective called Messy Ministry or Messy Church. Who's doing that? I, I saw it advertised somewhere and I thought I like that title. Because who knows that church where people are being born again is Messy Church. Proverbs goes on to say, but you need a strong ox for a large harvest and so the bible says the baby comes crying but but you know if you were that baby you would come crying too um i spoke about jordan earlier when jordan started coming to our youth ministry we started to see a whole number of kids from this public high school start to come to christ and come to our youth ministry and um you know what it was kind of feral and 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 i was praying about it. i'm like god what is with these young people like they're feral they don't obey instructions. They've got no respect for authority. Well, what's the deal? Like, it's so messy. And, and I was like starting to get kind of a bit self-righteous and annoyed about it. And then I really felt God say, you would be pretty messy if you would come from their basket as well. You know what one of the best things was that I ever did was um, dropped home. Uh, I would regularly drop home young people, but I still remember one particular girl that I dropped home with another leader in the car. Accountability, it's all good. You know, some things are universal. And, and as is a good habit, I said, hey, can, is mum or dad home? And she said, well, well, dad doesn't live at home, but yeah, mum's home. And, and so I went in to, to meet mum. And as the family door opened and I looked inside the home, in one second, I understood why she behaved the way she did. And, and I don't say that to judge, but just there was no carpet on the floors. The place was a mess. And I thought, you know what? Some people come from pretty difficult baskets. I hesitate to call them basket cases. But, but some people come from pretty difficult home environments and, and they come into our care and they're a bit messy. 
And God, help us to continue having a heart for broken, messy people. Because, hey, isn't it true that God accepted us in all of our mess? While we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God, help us to pass on that grace to others. Does that make sense? And so I really want to encourage you, look for the destiny behind the drama. Because there is going to be drama, I can promise you. But also, there's always destiny at work. Number four, the last one is this. Um, You've you got to see that there is, there is compassion behind every calling. The Bible says that this woman took pity on him and she said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. She just, she just demonstrated an act of compassion. That's all she did. Do you notice that she didn't lead worship? Do you notice that she wasn't an eloquent speaker? Do you notice that she wasn't like the coolest, the most hip, the most relevant? but she just demonstrated an act of compassion. You know, I meet many workers with young people who think, I'm not relevant enough. I'm not cool enough. I'm not on the Facebook. Uh, I, 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 how do I get on the line? Um, I, don't, I don't know enough of the Bible. Who knows? It's not about how relevant you are. It's not about what brand shoes you've got. It's not about whether you're on Facebook or not. Uh, what it's about is whether or not you can have a heart for young people. Some people say, I'm not cool enough. Let me tell you what the most cool thing is in the eyes of a young person. An adult who cares. That's what's cool. Um, Pharaoh's daughter, the Bible says, gave Moses' mother her wages, which means that, that for years, Pharaoh's daughter paid the bills and poured her resource into Moses' life. And then what became of Moses? What happened to Moses? Pardon me? It's always the English who are the most astute. What's your name? Stephen is right on the money. What does she do? She, she pours her money into Moses, her resource, for years, and then how is she rewarded? Moses kills a guy, buries him in the sand, and does a runner. And so for 40 years, Pharaoh's daughter sat back in the palace and thought, why on earth did I bother with Moses? He took 40 years of my resource. I invested my reputation. I invested my energy. I invested my emotional reserves into Moses. And then for 40 years, she felt like it was wasted. And yet, um, here's the point. Before God ever called Moses, there was a leader who cared for Moses. And I want to say, thank God for selfless, sacrificial, spiritual youth pastors and kids leaders who care for young people and pay the price until such point as God calls them and makes something great of their lives. And so um, behind this great calling of the man of Moses, Moses could point to an adult who showed compassion upon him. And it was that one act of compassion that caused Moses to fulfill his calling. Listen, even Billy Graham had a Sunday school teacher. Every great man or woman of God can point to someone who loved them enough to show compassion. And it was that one act of compassion that put them on a path where God could eventually call them. And so I want to encourage you, behind all the dramas that go with youth and kids ministry, uh, there is God raising up deliverers. And behind every great calling, there is someone who cared enough to show compassion. Let me conclude with this. Pharaoh's daughter only ever saw one young person saved. It's pretty miserable, really. Like, Pharaoh's daughter would have never got to present a masterclass at Thrive Summit. Like, she got one person saved, and he ended up being, you know, a murderer. Woo, great ministry that was. Um, her small group was pathetic. She had one person in her life group. And, and, then, and then he backslid. But who knows, even though she only reached one person, Moses did okay. Like in the end, Moses did good. A couple of million people liberated from slavery. One of the great prophets. The guy who beheld the glory of the Lord. Who knows, Moses did good. And so I want to encourage us this morning, don't lose heart because you just don't know what God is doing through those young people that he has entrusted to your care. Remember what Paul said in Galatians 6 and verse 9, let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. 
And so my encouragement is let's continue to lead and care for these young people like it's the highest calling and the very thing that God has put us on the planet to do because who knows, that's exactly what it is. It is a high calling. It's why God has us on the planet. And so let's continue to see beyond the surface level and see what God is really doing behind the scenes. Let me close with 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, where Paul says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, he made himself poor for our sake so that we might become rich. Isn't it true that at a point in our life when we needed it most, there was a God who cared enough to show compassion upon us, to divest himself of his resources so that you and I might be made rich. I want to encourage you, every time you do that for a young person, you are imitating the example of Christ. You are doing for others what Christ has done for you, showing compassion, believing in destiny, believing there's a redeemer and a redemptive plan, and divesting ourselves of what we could rightfully hold on to, but letting it go so that other people might be made rich. Can you say amen? amen? Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, we just pray that in the midst of everything that we do, God, we count it a great privilege. But Lord, I pray that you'd help us to focus on the right things. God, it's easy to grow weary. It's easy to lose heart if we forget that there's a harvest. But God, we thank you that you are the Lord of the harvest. God, you are always working, strategizing, working behind the scenes to bring about salvation. God, help us to be cognizant of that. Father, I pray just right now in this moment, for anyone here who does feel discouraged or faint-hearted this morning, Holy Spirit, I pray, just right now, come and bind up, come and strengthen. Holy Spirit, I pray, come and renew our vision. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would remind us afresh that Jesus did this for us and let that compel us to do it for others. We pray all of this in the beautiful name of Jesus, amen.